don't open that door. Come along with our triumph route of terror as we descend into darkness, hurtle into horror, and plunge into peril. If you've ever been murdered by your sibling in a castle, you're in the right place. I'm Justin, and the Brown King needs food badly. <laughs> That was well done. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, ciao, mi chiamo Nico e per un po' ho parlato fluentemente l'italiano, ma l'ho perso quando ero giovane. Okay, someone get the Google Translate on that stat. Yup. Uh, well, I'm Madonna. Oh. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> Jesus, God. And we are here today to review The Red Queen Kills Seven Times. This is directed by Emilio Miraglia, starring Barbara Boucher as Kitty, Ugo Pagliali as Martin, <laughs> Marina Malfatti as Francisca, <laughs> Pia Giancarlo as Rosemary, Ugo, not Ugo, you dense fuck, and Sybil Danning as Lulu. <laughs> so, we open with two sisters, Kitty and Eveline. And the two are fighting. Eventually, they head over to their grandfather, who's got a cursed-ass painting, and tells them about the legend of the Red Queen. Yo, for real, why did he keep that painting up? I know we're just right into the summary, but, like, goddamn, dude, get rid yeah, of it. I mean, yeah, good, it's good It's point. that easy. <laughs> Sorry. Once every 100 years, a woman that was killed by her sister awakens and kills seven people, with the seventh being a sister. Yeah. And it only ever happens when there are, like, sisters in that particular castle. But the movie doesn't spend too long explaining it, so neither will we. Just know that the Red Queen strikes every 100 years. Nico. TikTok, motherfucker. Great Kesha song. Well, 14 years pass and mamma mia! It's right about time oh. for the Red Queen to arise. The grandfather laments to Franziska. How do you- is that- did I say that right? Francisca. Francisca, thank you. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. The grandfather laments to Francisca, oh, 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 who is another one of his relatives, that Kitty never visits anymore, and Evelyn never writes. Apparently she's in America, but, like, no one ever checks. Well, yeah. as luck would have it, that very same night the Red Queen shows up, literally scaring old grandpapa to death. Oof. Francisca, uh, 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 hits up Kitty to let her know, and then we see a flashback to a couple months prior, where Kitty and Evelyn got into a fight, and Kitty accidentally backslapped this girl so hard into a statue that she dies, <laughs> and Francisca, uh, 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 helped her cover it up. Unfortunate. Well, it's time to read the grandfather's will, and this dude is playing some 5D chess from the grave, I tells ya, because all of his shit is supposed to go to Kitty, Franziska, uh, 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 and Evelyn, who only Kitty and Franziska, uh, 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 know are dead. And the details are in a separate will that is only to be read after a year's time has passed. Are you following? Yeah, I sure am. And just in case any uh, any Italian people want to cancel us right fast, just know that Nico, who goes by the true Italian name of Nicolo, is going to put up his Italian shield, which I'm assuming is just like a margarita pizza of some variety, to protect us. It's extremely old lasagna. It's just like a brick. <laughs> and with that out of the way, Dan, why don't you read this abomination that's on my screen? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Because we then cut to Kitty's job, and she works for a fashion company. As it turns out, she's banging Martin, who is the assistant director of the company. Well, he gets a promotion because the Red Queen kills the managing director, and so the police are called in. They post up a composite of what the killer looks like, and Kitty freaks out because it looks like Evelyn. On top of that, the Red Queen leaves Kitty a voicemail <laughs> claiming to be Evelyn. <laughs> well, she doesn't stop there, and the Red Queen starts murking people all around Kitty and Martin, leaving the two of them to be the prime suspects in the case. Yo, that drawing they used was so fucking bad. I've never, you know, in all my time, I've never 
seen that before. I am not aware with that technique. And I studied the history too. That must have, I've never heard of that technique before they use. It's really interesting because it's not a sketch. It's like the drawings you do in the shower when you have like a glass door pane or something and you like draw out lines in between the water droplets. That's what it looked like. It was not a sketch. <laughs> it looked like they made it in the old school like Star Fox Super Nintendo game. Like it looked like a polygon almost. It literally oh, yeah. did. So... I don't know about that. So it's no wonder they didn't find her. It looks just like her. And she's got like fucking trapezoids. <laughs> That's what killed me. But anyways, <laughs> as previously discussed by Dan, Martin's been boinking Kitty. But in reality, he's married and his wife's in a mental hospital. I do not know. And DOTD does not have a stance as to if that's better or worse. But here we are. <laughs> Oof. Anyhow... The Red Queen viciously murderates his wife by, let me just say, I'm sorry, I don't want to take it out, but this is probably one of Nico's favorite scenes. Literally, she tosses her like a ladder so she can climb over this like spike gate. <laughs> and the woman is like, oh, you're, I don't want you to trick me. It's like, here, give me your knife. And she's like, okay. And she gives her the knife. And then she climbs and she's like, psych. I had two knives. And then cuts it anyways. And I'm like, motherfucker, are you serious? Anyhow, <laughs> this puts even more heat on Martin because he's like the prime suspect in the case now. People are still dropping like flies and Kitty gets another phone call, this time telling her to meet Evelyn in the basement of the castle. Her grandfather had a lot of castles and territories and shit. Fucking Nepo babies. Meanwhile, Martin broke into a law firm because remember, boys and girls, Will's got to be filed. And that will hadn't been filed yet because it hadn't been read or revealed. Pro tip. So Martin broke into the law firm and reads the remainder of the will that was supposed to be read a year from now, realizing certain connections. He then heads over to the same castle where Kitty's going. So all of this is coming to a head, and only one man can beat down this case. Dan, what's going on? Well, Kitty heads to the basement where she finds Evelyn. Only it's not Evelyn. What? None. It's Rosemary. <sighs> her co-worker at the fashion firm. Love how she tastes. And Rosemary is dying. Francisca, ha, 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 then floods the basement in an attempt to kill Kitty. Martin arrives, and Francisca, ha, 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 gets shot by her husband at that. But before she dies, the entire plot is revealed. You see, if this wasn't confusing enough, Kitty didn't actually kill Evelyn, but Francisca, ha, 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 took advantage of the situation to kill her. To add more to the plot, the Evelyn that Francisca, ha, ha, Killed wasn't Kitty's real sister. Kitty's real sister was actually Rosemary, and the grandfather sent her away and replaced her with a peasant girl. <laughs> like you do. In an attempt to break the curse of the Red Queen. <laughs> well, that was a stupid idea and didn't work out. <laughs> the movie ends with Martin, who got stabbed, and Kitty riding to the hospital in ambulance, with Kitty being the sole inheritor of the grandfather's will, all according to Keikaku. <laughs> <laughs> Just I feel kidding, like, there was no plan on Kitty's end that we know of. I feel like everyone in this movie got exactly what they deserved. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. Well, there's a ton to talk about here, oh, and Jesus. we're not sponsored. Although I will take a sponsor from any um, Yushanka brands out there. Shout outs. Shout keep, outs. keep your head warm at night. How's this movie look, Nico? It's a gallo joint, Italian. How's it look? It looks good. I mean, we're not getting a ton of super visual fidelity or displays of tons of colors like in Suspiria, perhaps, but it's competently shot and it is, I would say, about on par with some of the other visuals from the time. The one thing that bugged me, though, was how frequently they used zooms. It's like every scene was on a fucking dolly, and it's just like, God damn, pick a spot, my brother, in Christ. In Cristo. In Cristo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last podcast we recorded, we were also making allusions to other religions, so I guess it's only fair. I have something to share with you guys, by the way, after this. <laughs> oh, no. So, Shout out to all case, my roasters out there. We love you. Hey, for real, for real. 
The only thing I really got to add in terms of the looks, first off, this movie has a ton of unabashed nudity, which I've come to expect from Gallo joints, really. Yeah. And the fashion, I like the fashion. I ain't going to front. Some of those suits, I know they were working for a fashion company, but I was like, yo, where do I get one of those? Probably Italy, to be honest. And I didn't like, though, how... Yeah, it's going to be a great podcast. Can't keep it together, Nico. You're stupid. <laughs> we, of course you would get Italian garments in Italy. Where Anyways. the fuck else? They're in Italy. I got this shirt of Montana, brother. Not quite sure how it shipped it all the way over here, but I'm here in this here gal joint. <laughs> I'm goofy now. Wasn't planned out when I started this, but here we are. <laughs> With that interesting aside out of the way, one thing I didn't like was how the cuts between scenes were so sudden. Yeah. Like, holy shit. So, like, there was literally a scene one time where Kitty was, like, in the basement of something, and then, bam, she's in Martin's bedroom. And I'm like, yo, 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 there has to be, there has to be some kind of, like, give me a traveling cut, give me something, because people are jumping all over the place. I'm like, damn. So... That's the only thing I really didn't like visually. But Dan, how did the visuals speak to you? I thought they were fine. I mean, I don't really have too much to add other than what both of you said. Well, what's that I hear? It's not the sound of music, but it's the sound of the movie. And Dan, what did the sound sound like to you? I thought the sound sounded pretty good. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much everything was dubbed, um, right. obviously. Uh, and the dubs I thought were actually done fairly well. So Sybil Danning, who played Lulu from Final Fantasy X, was unhappy that the filmmakers actually chose a different actress to dub her own voice, mm. which mm. kind of sucks, that, I guess. Yeah, that's rough. But um, aside from that, I don't know why. Maybe she has an ugly voice. I don't know. <laughs> My apologies, hey. Sybil Danning. I, I, I but, was uh, thinking like maybe it was just a bad take or something. Nah, her voice is trash, bro. I mean, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't heard her voice. I wouldn't know. That's it, but fair. Other than that, I, I thought the audio was fine. There was some, some, some good music in it, too, actually. I enjoyed the music. So I will say this. First off, Arnold in The Terminator, I didn't realize this, but did you know that they didn't let Arnold voice himself in the German dub of The Terminator either? Huh. Hmm. I wonder why. Yeah, even though German. he speaks fluent German, he's, you know, he. I mean, it is. they said that his German was too countryside. And so uh, his accent was too hick, basically. That's fucking And they funny. didn't like it. So it could have been something like that, I guess, because she's also from Austria. Hmm. Yeah. So you see, maybe they just don't have the the dial. Although this is, movie was in Italian, but you know, maybe they just don't have the Italian over there in Austria maybe, like they maybe, used to. Maybe Austrians just suck at languages and dialects. Maybe, wow. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. We're, we're trying to see how many different people we can insult here on the podcast. Nico. Hey, I mean, two out of two. Austrian actors that I've known or heard about have not been able to dub their own lines. So <laughs> maybe they just suck. Can we also say how this movie is another exa shining example of the Italian voiceover industry where it looks like the actors were once again all fucking speaking different languages at the same time. Just like, why? Why? Pick one and stick with it. I guarantee you it will be less frustrating to work with than fucking, fuck a Duolingo. This is like quadruple lingo times a million. And it's all just so incredibly uncanny. There's a couple scenes where I'm pretty sure there was someone who was speaking Spanish while there was someone also speaking Italian. And then mystery third flavor of language that definitely wasn't either of those. But like, my God, what a fucking linguistic melange of chaos this movie is. Hmm. I didn't catch up on that. That seems to be pretty common for a lot of Gallo flicks and I guess stuff in the Italian industry at that point in time. Interesting to note because also spaghetti westerns, like they also had a lot of those same difficulties. Yeah. This is so, also Italian. Yeah, there you go. You can tell by the word western. Yep. <laughs> so I'll say the only thing for me in sound that you guys haven't touched on really is the Red Queen has this laugh and it's supposed to be menacing. It sounds like you just, I swear <laughs> to God. Like she's running away, ah, go on, <laughs> and I'm just like, yo. And it doesn't make it any better when later you find out that like the Red Queen is not even. 
I guess we should just say it now. So Rosemary has been running around as the Red Queen. And she only does it when she gets high. Because you see, Francisca uh, 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 had gotten Rosemary hooked on drugs with the help of this drug dealer named Peter to blackmail Kitty. And yeah, that was a whole deal. But basically, Francisca uh, 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 learned about Rosemary and then Rosemary would get high and dress up as the Red Queen and go kill people. So convoluted ass plot. <laughs> that happened for a while. And I mean... Her laugh, man, was not menacing at all. No, Anyways, she was high. I yeah, mean. she just sounds like a stoner laugh. <laughs> but like, it could have been worse, I guess. But Nico, I want to ask this straight up: Is this horror to you? And Dan, is this not horror to you? <laughs> no. I don't think it's horror. I mean, I know it, it falls into the gallo kind of mm -hmm. genre, uh, which is very, like, murder, mystery, right. with some horror, with some psychological, with some bunch of stuff, melting pot. Right, right, right. But I don't really see much of the horror part in it. None of it was really particularly scary. And sure, there's somebody going around murdering people, but not in a scary way. It was, to me, pretty devoid of horror elements. It was mostly just murder mystery to me. Yeah. Okay. I agree with that for the record. I think at the beginning, there was like the slightest of hints of that because kid, um, Evelyn, she was talking about how she looked at the picture kid of the Goku. Red Queen. Kid Evelyn. Hey, she had a high power level because she looked at the portrait and then she started did. stabbing this doll. And I was like, wait, are you possessed by the picture? Like what's going on here? But then that was never followed up on again, ever. Yeah. Like ever. Nico, you don't think this is horror either, I take it. No, it's it, it's not. It's just a murder mystery at its core. I think it has the trappings of potentially being like adjacent to gothic something or other, maybe, but it's not quite. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, I want to ask you guys, do you like the mystery that they told in this? Basically that, hey, there's the whole scheme to get the inheritance. Did you like the mystery for what it was? No, I didn't. I found, well, much like the rest of this plot, very convoluted and difficult to keep track of. It was interesting, and the characters had good chemistry between one another, and I can't think of any scene where I wasn't like actually engaged with what was going on but i just I, I don't know man something about the narrative threads of this one just completely fucking escaped my my grasp here i see i i agree i i think the core aspects of it were good sort of like the the red queen mythos if you will the lore the in, inheritance part but then the whole just they i feel like they overdid it and they went too much they got too lost in the sauce of trying to make this mystery and plot reveals and twists and whatever and it, it was just too much yeah and one thing that i agree with you guys both is there anything that you think they could have done to tell the story more coherently honestly i think just cut out a lot of the banter and side conversations between some of the characters like I don't remember which two it was specifically, but there's a conver Justin, I talked to you about this earlier. There's this conversation with uh, some model, and was that Francisca? Uh, 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 was she the model? I can't no, Francisca uh, 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 doesn't work for the company. Okay, well, there's some model who talks with a, a different employee, and they spend just, I don't know, five minutes sexually harassing each other for laughs. <laughs> so like and it adds nothing to the story whatsoever i gotta say right fast sorry to cut in but this show has some one-liners yo jesus christ like there's christo. one in, there's one in particular christo there's one in particular that stands out when like lulu was boinking the managing director of the fashion company before he died and so, like, she's talking to Martin, and she's like, Martin, I know you want a woman like me. And she, like, takes off her clothes and shit in front of him. And he's like, no. 
And then she's like, what do you mean? I know you're boinking kitty. She probably just like, you probably just sit in a corner and think about sex without even having it. And then he's like, Lulu, we need models, not whores. I would fire you if I was the director. And walks away and I'm like, Jesus, man, calm down. And like, there's another part where like Lulu, so Martin eventually gives in as he's want to do and ends up boinking Lulu. But then Lulu's sitting there on the bed and she's again like, Kitty can't do what I can. I know several tricks. Pulls out some yo Even the police know I'm an incredible nymphomaniac. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? All right, man. All right. So I guess I guess that's a thing. I don't know. But yes. And to put in my details. It's fucking bad shit. Yeah. I do actually like the mystery they told. And... To do it more coherently, I think it requires a change and a more constant POV. One issue the movie has is we're flung all over the place. All these different points of view, different characters, different conversations. And it almost feels like we just move from conversation to conversation to conversation without any real links between these things. Things happening in between that lead to other things. So first off, Peter, he's this drug dealer who ends up like sexually assaulting Kitty for like 10 seconds and then is forgotten about totally. I would have just cut him out of the movie completely. Yeah. Totally fucking yeah. pointless. Yeah. Like, he doesn't need to be there. And his scenes with Kitty don't need to be there at all. The blackmail, not irrelevant at all. And from there, I would actually take it more so as, like, the police investigating the crime. Yeah. If they wanted to go that way and have it be kind of like... Because it's set up like a traditional Sherlock Holmesian almost mystery. Like, there's this supernatural story of the Red Queen, and you have this cast of characters with all this different stuff to hide. And it would have been really cool to approach it from a detective angle to see a detective solving it and uncovering all these aspects. Yeah, that would have been tight. Like, yeah. As opposed to, like, giving me a really weird scene of, like... Evelyn dying except she didn't really die except she did two seconds later and I'm like okay I guess so that's one thing I don't know but Dan I want to ask you a question here and you are kind of the you know when we meet up and you know we we play like a video game or a board game or something I'm always trying to come up with like a 600 IQ strategy and you're always the one to foil me mm -hmm. yeah I'm always the one to die just because yeah so I want to ask, the grandfather had like a 10,000 IQ strategy to avoid the Red Queen, which was, and hear me out, there are two girls, Kitty and Evelyn, but he knows that, <laughs> not here, <laughs> he knows, maybe Lulu would be down for that, Oh no! but he knows that the two girls already don't like one another and they're very reminiscent of the Red Queen and the Black Queen from the story of the Red Queen. So what he does is he takes Evelyn, sends her away, and she becomes Rosemary. He then gets like a poor peasant girl because, you know, pretty easy to come by, I guess, where he's from. And he just like, I don't want to sound fucked up, but he probably like purchases her or she's an orphan or something. I don't know. But like he brings her into the family and she is now Evelyn. And apparently Kitty doesn't know. She does not know that the girl so she was... Playing with. That was that was part of my confusion. Was like, <laughs> when did this exchange happen? <laughs> like, I didn't realize until you just said that it was sometime after the opening scene. Yeah, yeah, same. Because yeah, that makes no sense that she doesn't know that her sister is not the same person anymore. <laughs> literally. <laughs> Jesus Christ! You just has hyper face blindness. So that happens, and then his plan is. After he dies, the will will be read a year after, wherein he reveals his secret plot. And the will says that he knew he would die that year due to his, like, failing condition. And therefore, he knew that he would die in the hundredth year, wherein the Red Queen would likely strike again. Does this plan make any sense to anyone here? Not a goddamn lick of it, no. No, I would just move. <laughs> Literally! Or you don't need that castle. If that castle's the haunted thing, just fucking leave. You're rich, bitch. Yeah, he is. He is. And like, if you know, if you're so convinced that like this hundredth year is going to fall the same, like on that year and it's going to haunt you or whatever, just go somewhere else. Fuck, send Evelyn to America for real. <laughs> like, that, they wouldn't be together anymore. Like, 
take an extendo vacation or some shit. Like, I don't... And... I, I don't know. Instead of fucking Freaky Friday sister swap thing, I don't know. <laughs> the thing about the movie too, Nico, is they say that like it always happens when there's like two sisters in the same castle, but then the two sisters don't live in the same castle and they're actually like far apart. Yeah, they definitely don't. They're not proximal to each other at all. And also, one, how did Evelyn not know? But two, how did Rosemary not know? She just got like dropped off at some random's house <laughs> one day and, and never thought about it again. Yes, this is home now. I mean, she was like, what, eight or something when it happened? I don't know. Six. Yo, know, what if Old she enough. was just like, man, I fucking hate my dad. I wish I had new parents. Oh, shit. Wakes up the next morning. Oh, wow. <laughs> that actually works. That's awesome. <laughs> My favorite part is that, like, Francisca uh, 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 found out and, like, assembled this whole plot. But the kicker of it was one of two things happened here. Either option one, Francisca found out about the whole, like, kid swap thing before they killed the fake Evelyn. Or she scrambled after and happened to luck into the fact that that wasn't the real Evelyn that was killed. And it was actually Rosemary. Because either way, it doesn't make much sense. I need, like, a corkboard chart with the yarn to visualize what the fuck is even going on as we're saying this. But what I really want to know is... I'm lost. Wait, that couldn't have been Rosemary, though, right? Which one? Who, who was killed in the water? Who was phone? That was the fake Evelyn. Fevelyn. That was the one that they replaced Rosemary with. Okay. But that's my confusion because she did she just kill her? She says she killed her on a whim. Right. She says she didn't even have a plan at that point. But that was just a couple months ago. So when the fuck did Rosemary show up? Who was supposedly an old friend. Right. Right. Metal Gear. And she had the pendant? No, Lulu had a fucking pendant yeah. that belonged to Evelyn as a child. But was that the real Evelyn or the fake Evelyn? Doesn't even matter. Shadow Moses. What the fuck? I'm sorry. This whole movie just blew my mind. And we got to keep it moving. Because... Fucks are alive. <laughs> Anyways. Sorry. You got you to gotta watch this shit, okay? Because this is making not no fucking <laughs> no, sense. No, you don't got to watch this shit. Spoilers for about 15 minutes from now. You don't got to watch this shit. <laughs> so it's time for the what would you do? And I'm going to ask directly. I'm going to put you in the shoes of perhaps the one logical person in the whole movie the police inspector. Yeah, for once. How? No, do... fuck a police inspector oh, too, oh, bro. Oh, oh shit. You, you want to know why? This dude goes, Martin, do you have an alibi? Martin goes, yes, I do. I was doing this. And the police inspector goes, bullshit, you made that up. <laughs> All right, next time. Do you have an alibi? <laughs> yes, I do. I did this. Bullshit, you made that up. <laughs> what the fuck is the point of an alibi? <laughs> if you just told BS on everyone. No, like, the best part is. They check out. Like, They're no. real. The best part is he goes, it's suspicious that you have an alibi for these two <laughs> events. And I was like, oh shit. Men's a hater. But all Fuck right. the police. I put you in the shoes of the police and you're the one investigating this. What would you do to solve this crime faster and catch the Red Queen? I would do just like basic level detective work. Like, hey, did you see anyone in a red dress cackling like a fucking maniac within the last few nights? Just, I mean, to my knowledge, there wasn't any actual fucking investigation in this film. There was one small bit, but Dan, I'm sorry, quick sidebar. I told yeah. you sex workers hang out in the park. Oh, did, well, yeah, but you, you told us? Were we? You did. What, three weeks ago or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you did. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, sidebar uh, over. Continue, Nico. Now, now I've lost the plot. Dan, you say something. He just freaked my bean. I would learn and research the the Red Queen uh -huh. lore, because even if I didn't believe it, it's clear that there is a serial killer or something who is reenacting it. Right, right, right. Uh, so I would, you know, learn about it and try to dive into. I think it's pretty obvious that in the past, the seventh kill is the sister. I think he knows that too. Mm -hmm. but I would look into like what happened in the past to see 
what other people were killed if if they even have that information i don't know 100 years is a long time ago but uh yeah i guess that's what i would do so there's two things that i would do and it's not like i'm bringing any kind of uh work experiences to this at all <laughs> but man thing number one whenever a will is read and not all participants are not there you don't just shake shrug your head and go oh she's in america so she doesn't get her inheritance like you have to make a more than a reasonable and rational attempt to contact them which the police do in about five minutes when they actually decide to they're like yo we checked evelyn did not go to america and i was like that is the number one thing you should have done yep. mm -hmm. from also, the start the police were like she didn't go to america she didn't fly she didn't take a boat she didn't use an alternate name she, must she didn't have do swam. anything like like how did you know she didn't use an alternate name maybe she's just too good for you like fair how would they know it seems like it would they would be pretty easy to evade all things considered now the obvious thing is italy is not like landlocked or anything like you can get to anywhere in europe from italy yeah mm -hmm. and it's not like back in those days they had real computerized records yeah for fucking real so there's no gps tracking you if you wanted to you could just like fucking dip to morocco what are they gonna do nothing well the biggest thing here is this let's keep something in mind all of Evelyn's friends would have been like, yo, she disappeared. She Straight went to the, the castle and then she just never came back and they told us she went to America. Evelyn never talked about going to America. The castle's name was America. <laughs> Dude, that would have made more sense. But also, the police neglected to search the fucking crime scene, man. Literally. The died. Yeah. They, like, they, they straight up don't investigate crime scenes. I mean, what the fuck? So yes, again, simple investigation. That's what I would do. <laughs> but the biggest thing is this, man. The fucking Red Queen is over here calling people and leaving voicemails and shit. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, you can't like get someone there to like listen to a voice and realize it's fucking Rosemary. She's right there. She's right yeah. fucking there. No one was like, hey, that's fucking Rosemary. Did, did you guys, you hear that? Like, no one, there's people who can do this. And I'm like, come on, guys. You guys suck. Anyways, not that that has any impact on this. <laughs> it's time for the critical review. And it doesn't have anything on Rotten Tomatoes, so don't fucking ask. Oh. But there is an IMDb. And it's got, well, I ain't going to say what it's got. You guess what it's got. I hope it's low. <laughs> I hope it's low. I'm going to guess like four stars. So 40, I guess. Well, no, no, no. Give me a number out of 100. Okay. Um, 41. Mm -hmm. Dan? I was going to say 62. Dan, you win. It's got a yes. 6.5 out of 10, making Ooh, it a close. 65 out of 100. Dan, you're real close. But I want to know what you guys think about La Dama Rosa, Uside Sette Volte. I'll go first. And, uh, you know... As I was watching this, I was kind of thinking to myself, and I made a joke with the lads, oh, this is like better Yaga. Ha ha. Because, you know, Baba Yaga, that's another kind of Gallo yeah. film we watch. Ha ha. But after actually hashing this out, I feel like I'm somehow looking back more fondly on that movie. And that movie was like hella racist in parts, which... <laughs> I don't, and but it also did have some bitch and good saxophone. Not that I'm saying I'm just gonna stop. Yeah, forty. Dan, I'm with Nico on it. Forty. It it was a rough one. It did not capture my attention. I found myself just like checking my phone all the time and just like scrolling through Instagram and doing shit. Um, it was too convoluted. We already pointed out a lot of the dumb shit. Good core ideas, but execution was was lacking, in my opinion. So I'm going to go with a 40 as well. I'm going to drop a bombshell here. I'm going to give this one a 65. And I actually liked it. I thought that... I mean, that's fair. There's a lot of good ideas here. I just... I just wish someone had really sat down and been like, yo... This does not make any fucking sense. Because if you just like turn your brain off and just listen to what they tell you and say, okay, then you're fine. 
Like, there's nothing, like, you're going to enjoy the movie a lot more. Like, okay, cool. Lulu hates Martin, but then really wants to sleep with Martin. But Martin has this wife in the hospital that they're like, well, he's a scumbag because he's boinking Kitty. But then, no, he's really trying to be loyal to Kitty. But then he boinks Lulu and Kitty and everyone. And he is a sleaze. And I'm just like, oh, okay. And the movie treats him like a hero at the end. And I'm like, there you go. So, yeah, I mean, it's just an awkward film at times. But there's so many good ideas here that I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to read it too low. So 65 for me. Although, I'm going to say it bluntly, I would probably not recommend this movie to anyone. You got to be like a real diehard Gallo fan or like mystery fan for me to recommend this one to you. But this isn't really a good plot. And that's that's a shame because that to me is the biggest letdown of the movie, the plot, more so than anything else. I take it from the 40s, you guys also probably would not have recommended it. No. Nah. Nope. Uh, I guess any last words before we wrap this one up? Mama Mia, here we go again. <laughs> well, if you like what you've heard or if you want to tell us your opinion, hit us up. We're on X and Instagram at DOTD Horror. We're also on Facebook, which is, of course, Don't Open That Door. And you can check everything we've done on our website, which is dotdhorror.com. But till next time, dear listener, take care of yourselves. Watch out for the Red Queen. And as always, dear listener, don't open that door. Bye.